There was no shortage of praise for Disco Elysium since its release in 2019. In particular, the quality and complexity of writing and narrative, combined with several interesting artistic choices, made for a very successful title. However, most of that praise went to features present in other media. The surreal art style, the somber music tones, the postmodernish literary traits. In many reviews, it was easy to forget Disco Elysium is a game. In this video, I intend to remedy that, by analyzing the game systems of Disco Elysium in combination with the social and existential themes presented through the narrative, but especially gameplay. The intensity of spoilers shall increase as the video goes, becoming hardcore towards the end. You have been warned. Disco Elysium is a peculiar video game. There are not that many games that make you read that much for starters. There are reportedly over a million words in the game, which is equivalent to all seven Harry Potter books, with a lot more quality if I may add. I really must insist you buy one of the books. The Stonian artist Robert Kurvitz was the lead writer, which for a game so focused on the writing is a role equivalent to game director. Reportedly, his friend Alexander Rostov encouraged him by saying, We failed at so many things, let us also fail at making a video game. Together, they built a team that can be proud to say they did not fail again. Disco Elysium is very successful and also a great video game, but it is the kind of art that begs the question. Why is it a game? Could it be a novel or a series of books instead? Or maybe even a tabletop RPG, as it looks a lot like one? The short answer is that the question is irrelevant. Disco Elysium is a video game period, and we can roll with that. It would be like arguing if certain movies would be better as a painting or a novel, even when it's possible they could be. But I like the more complex answer. We need to consider what being a game changes about Disco Elysium if we presume it could be something else. Most of the time, people point to interactivity and non-linearity as qualities games have that other forms of storytelling are not as good at reproducing. In that way, Disco Elysium benefits from being a game due to the options players have to proceed with the narrative in an active manner. If you do not want to talk to Tommy, you can avoid him. I am a gander and a hunter and a gatherer, feel like a traveler. If you prefer trying to deceive your precinct and say you did not lose your gun, you can. He says he didn't lose his gun. Oh, it's fun, whatever that means. The ability of making these choices, leading to thousands of possible branching paths, is something people usually point to as a particular feature of video games. Although I do not disagree with that, it seems rather incomplete. First, because some works of other media also played with these elements of choice, albeit in a limited fashion. For example, the Argentinian author Julio Cortázar wrote a novel named Rayuela, or Hopscotch in English, trying to give readers options in order to decide what chapters they should read next. Possibilidad de elecciones, de dejar de dejar de lado una parte del libro y leer otra, o leerla en otro orden y crearse un un, un mundo en el cual él desempeñaba un papel activo y no pasivo. More recently, the Black Mirror episode Bandersnatch presented viewers with choices to proceed with the narrative in one way or another. You decide what your character does. They're like a game. Sounds thrilling. How about you decide what you want for your breakfast? Hmm? These are of course experimental and are not comparable to what games have to offer, but it is enough to demonstrate we need a bit more to characterize games as a specific art form. What games also need are rules and ways to evaluate progress or success. Even a completely narrative game 
usually enforces a few physics rules and requires you to be thorough in exploring the scenarios to get all the important story moments and information. And with rules come the systems, the combinations of rules and mechanics that operate in games, sometimes very visibly, sometimes in a hidden way. Disco Elysium has a few systems in place, all very simple in how they function, but with ramifications that can make each playthrough very unique. For starters, you have an exploration system that takes you as the detective to access different locations and find different items and persons, or rather to find the dialogues. The bulk of the game is spread throughout countless conversations you can have with several NPCs and objects, and also with yourself. Behold. The dialogue system is the most important piece of Disco Elysium and what the players use to interact with the entire world and to perform every action. Moving along the dialogue trees will lead to skill checks, which can be passive and mostly hidden from the player until they appear, but also active checks the player can decide to try or not, with some being available only at one point in time. The skill system by its turn is what generates gameplay variety. Dialogue options are mostly the same unless you have high levels of particular skills, which makes it more likely to be successful in passive checks, to open new dialogue and sometimes more active checks for you. Increasing gameplay variety further, the thought cabinet is a very unique feature where you can internalize specific thoughts that give you skill modifiers during their loading time and usually some better ones after fully internalized. Successful task completion leads the player to get experience points, every hundred of them, and you can increase one of your skills or open up a space in the thought cabinet. And that is it. There are some other smaller mechanics like finding and using money, but 95% of the time you'll be exploring the district of Martinez, finding opportunities to engage in dialogue to investigate the murder you're supposed to solve, or maybe to pursue other questions that appear throughout the narrative. More importantly, the question of who you are and what in the world caused your strange drunken amnesia. As time passes and the investigations advance in Disco Elysium, you realize how the murder is ultimately not that important in the grand scheme of things, with many other thematic layers weaving a complex tapestry. There is nothing, only warm primordial blackness. Disco Elysium starts off as another case of an amnesiac protagonist. Memory loss became a cliché even in games because it is a very convenient way to approximate the player or viewer to the protagonist. This cop does not know anything about the world around him, he just woke up in a very sorry state. You do not know anything as well, and now you can learn through him and his weird questions. From now on, the game expects you to keep your curiosity activated about things in the game world and about the protagonist. Who is this cop? And why has he drunk himself out of his own memory of self? To make matters worse, or better depending on your cup of tea, Amnesia Cop has a shattered personality inside of him. Our character has more than a couple of dozen voices inside his head trying to steer him around towards some goals, some of them decidedly weird. You should lick that stain off the counter. Yeah, man. Let's get wild. Lick it. Most of these voices are the specific skills we already mentioned, but there is also the ancient reptilian brain and the limbic system, to provide a bit more of ancestral guts to Amnesia Cop's humanity. Altogether, they present themselves by commenting on what is going on, sometimes in a contradictory manner and often with comic relief. Such a mental bedlam requires the players to make their own decisions when facing problems, but the complexity of those can increase rapidly. Starting from a relatively innocent lie to conceal your amnesia from your partner, you are likely going to be thrust into uncomfortable conversations about racism and prejudice right out of the gate. 
Tabletop RPGs usually provide players with some amount of freedom to define their characters, from names and physical appearance to goals and actions that impact the plot. Video games are more limited, as you cannot program every possible action a player could think of. Even with over a million words, Disco Elysium is still very limited in that regard. However, the game accepts these limitations and works around them, transforming the act of character building into a slow process of finding one's own style and internal preferences. You cannot be anything but a male cop, but your amnesia allows freedom to decide what kind of male cop you want to be, with situations constructed to force you to define yourself within the game world. For example, it is interesting that for all of its major thematic layers, Disco Elysium decided to start its expensive array of human interactions with a very primal one, sexual attraction. The conversation with Classie, the game's femme fatale, can be approached as an innocent discovery of your job as a cop, which you couldn't remember but she knew, already putting her in more control but also as an attempt to woo her into a physical relationship with sad but hilarious consequences. <laughs> what was that? That's not even how words are used. What did you say? Come on, say it again. Throughout Disco Elysium, simple and complicated issues are presented with that degree of freedom in mind but always confronting you with your tendencies. Apologize too much, and one of the voices in your head suggests you should be a sorry cop. Talk too much about how the worker class is the future, and Krasmazov might appear in your head. Keep asking for money, and you have the chance to become a hobo cop. Technically, you wouldn't be a cop anymore, but a hobo. That would mean game over for the cop chapter of your adventures, but who knows where the hobo part takes you. At some point you realize the thought cabinet is less important for the number modifiers it provides and more to slowly build something resembling a complex personality, even if you choose not to display every aspect of it all the time. Your likely first interaction with the thought cabinet will come out of some frustrating circumstances, as the game does not stop with your very bad pickup line to Classie. You own your hostel a considerable amount of money due to the damages you caused, but cannot remember doing. You lost your badge and your gun and have no idea about the case you are supposed to solve. And the cadaver is still hanging there, with a terrible smell that makes you puke. Maybe twice. After failing these difficult checks, you are given the volumetric shit compression, which is a thought to make it easier to examine the body. It's still your choice to internalize it or not, and it's not a complete guarantee that the next check will not fail as well. After all, you can be many things, but you are mostly a failure as a human being. Now is a good moment to talk about how failure is important, as a theme and a gameplay mechanic. It is easy to imagine a different version of Disco Elysium that is a pure visual novel. You could transform all of the active skill checks into passive checks or remove the system altogether. You would still interact with dialogues and have a great amount of freedom. What makes skill checks wrapped in the RPG mechanics an appealing feature is not freedom or randomness, as you could apply those regardless but actually how they generate a sense of ownership over your successes and failures. You decide if the character will be more of an athletic cop or a thinking one, and as you go through the game, the ability to be successful in particular skill checks is determined by these preferences. Video games allow immediate feedback to actions you perform with a controller or keyboard and mouse so they evolved beyond the limitations of tabletop RPGs and other board games. Instead of rolling dice to see if you'll be successful in performing whatever action you want, you can provide an input through buttons previously defined as analogous to those actions, and the simulated activity can be presented in a semi-realistic form on the screen. Attack with square or a click on the mouse, dodge with circle or whatever, and so on. 
Such a configuration allows video games to test your reflexes and manual ability on top of the usual decision-making processes that every game is built upon. This Coelysium does not require any manual skill whatsoever. It is a pure tabletop game in that sense. The only requirements are having a machine capable of running it and being able to read. The lack of mechanical challenge to the player guarantees that only the decision making through the trees of dialogues is being tested. Although testing is not something Disco Elysium is actually doing, it is a game laser focused on role play, discovery and experimentation. Also, the game wants you to embrace the moments of failure as interesting points for storytelling, not something you need to improve yourself to perform, like a Celeste platforming challenge. The narrative progresses regardless of your successes or failures, with only a couple of significant exceptions. For now, consider how liberating that can be. Failing is not a problem, as it leads to interesting results. On the other hand, Succeeding does not necessarily always lead to a better outcome, and the game should have even more moments, like when our cop shows how he does not know the rules of petanque. Merde! Bordel de merde! A whole house of shit. Beyond liberating the player from the need to get everything right like other more mechanically oriented games do, the design of Disco Elysium allows for easier immersion into the roleplay. When you do not have to be concerned with getting the right result to progress, the focus naturally shifts to the world and the characters, establishing more meaningful narrative rewards. The flip side is that almost no player will be able to see everything the game has to offer, even with multiple playthroughs, particularly the available thoughts you can internalize. I played it three times, with the one I used for this footage being as comprehensive as possible, and there are still a good dozen or so thoughts I never received, some checks I have never even seen. Sacrificing completeness is a small price to pay, however in favor of thousands of branching paths encouraging replayability well beyond what would be expected of a narrative that is centered around solving a murder. However, and there is always a however, there are a couple of design choices that undermine this significantly. Detective, is everything alright? First and last damning, but still problematic, the task log annotates every single minor quest you may have activated, some of them just as a result of pursuing dialogue options. Having a log is necessary to keep track of everything in such a long and rich game, but sometimes the way these tasks are described can make players think they are all required, not optional pursuits. King Katsuragi is there to remember you should try to solve the murder, of course and for the most part you only deviate from that path intentionally. Are you sure we have time to go chasing after bug hunters just now? But the list of tasks can generate the thirst for completionism, detracting from role-playing. I would be lying if I said I have a good solution for this problem, but it's still an issue nonetheless. What is more problematic, but fixable, is saves coming. The game allows you to save your progress at every time, with virtually infinite space on top of it. It also auto-saves frequently. This feature is very convenient as you can see on the screen right now. In fact, it sped up the process of acquiring footage for this video significantly. However, maximizing my ability to ramble about the game is not the most important goal, I would assume. The side effect of allowing save files to become so malleable is to erode the sense of failure as an interesting result. If you have the forethought of saving before an important check, be that one you can repeat or a supposedly unrepeatable one, you can try no matter how many times you need to eventually get the results you wanted. <laughs> yes, it would be very frustrating if a playthrough were to be impaired because you made a bad choice or even an incorrect input that slipped through your fingers. You know, the kind of mistakes we all do, and presumably so does our character. 
but some frustration is required in this setting, particularly with how much the game is focused around existential crisis. The ability to become a real super cop getting everything you want should not be part of the experience. No one wants their state monopoly on violence to be mixed with celebrity worship. Players should face the consequences of their actions, and many actually do, either because they choose not to save scum or because they do not realize it's a viable strategy. Even so, developers sometimes need ruthlessness, and they should have been more confident in designing ways around potential soft locks and be more stringent with the save files. But in order for ruthlessness to work, all the saving should still be possible, as there are many ways to get an abrupt ending in the game. The health and morale systems are a little too harsh, and should be communicated better to the player before they decide to allocate their attribute points. Focus only on your mind powers, and every physical failure has some potential of killing you. Likewise, focus only on the body, and being ashamed repeatedly becomes a potential game over. Cop gives up the detective genre for social realism. These endings are funny, but not if they can happen every single time. As a compromise, maybe they should allow saves coming for second playthroughs, but not for the first one, while making abrupt endings a little less likely. After all, we all want to shine in karaoke, but sometimes the limbic system is the one calling the shots. I would often go there To the tiny church there To the tiny church there The smallest church in Sansan Now it once was larger Even beyond gameplay when considering only the narrative, failure is needed because it is the whole personal theme of the game for our protagonist, for the city of Ravishaw, for the entire world of Elysium actually. Explaining away those failed lives is not possible given the systemic character they present. Everything is interconnected, and beyond the aspirations and issues underlying the conversations of Harry Dubois, the most important gameplay systems are those shared by the community, social and cultural systems. In the tiny yard there, I have been so glad here. In some games, players need to adjust their expectations based on how different the game world presents itself compared to our real world. Interaction and decision-making require some level of comprehension of what are the stakes, what are the rules in the world. Disco Elysium veers very close to science fiction from the start, but as a world, it has some important similarities to Earth. Humans appear to have very similar biological features, the day cycle is identical to ours, for the most part, classical laws of physics seem to hold, as well, political and historical factors have several comparable aspects. There are communists, liberals, moralists, fascists. The central conflict of the story is a dispute between a billionaire company and the dock workers union of Martinez. Mundane and comparable to things we see in the papers every Tuesday. There are also historical aspects reminiscent of our world's history. A failed communist revolution, like the Paris Commune, an international coalition taking over the country, like it happened with Germany after World War II, etc. There are lots of differences, particularly in the specifics, but the basics seem to be very familiar, including prejudice and racism. Welcome to Rivachol. Racism as a topic is not something most people are willing to discuss, except on very general terms. It may help that Elysium is a different world from ours, but some of the racial dynamics are remarkably similar. Silence. The air between them becomes tense. What is more important, however, is how much the game design accommodates players who wish, for any reason, to pursue plainly racist and fascist thoughts. 
One could argue that Disco Elysium actually incentivizes this approach, by soft-locking progression towards solving the murder if you do not internalize the advanced race theory thought, given to the player by the character Measurehead, who eventually takes the body off the tree, or rather a whole branch off the tree. You need to internalize what you have heard here today, then return to me. This clarity does not come instantly. You can actually solve the murder without ever examining the cadaver, and you can also have a perfectly aimed shot to the rope. But most players will probably have to discuss racism as part of the progression path. Regardless, I appreciated a lot that they allowed players to take the politics of Rebel Shaw in any direction they wanted. It was the only really coherent decision if the design wanted both amnesia and curiosity to drive the conversations. If we want to roleplay, how do we know our amnesia cop was not a racist before his fatidic drunken brain damage? It is ultimately our choice to impact the story that way, with her partner Kim getting very upset but still professionally aiding the investigation. More provocatively even, the player does not know if nativism has a point in this world. Racism is the first refuge of many as a tribalistic response to a confusing world where you feel somehow threatened. Of course, racism is terrible, but if the game restricts political approaches only to the tasteful ones, the artificiality of the social system in the game world becomes too evident. You are not making a meaningful choice between fascism and something else if the first option is not really available. Similarly, you cannot understand any of these perspectives without delving more into them. Internalizing advanced race theory allows you to answer measure head in a variety of ways. It is not a compromise, it is intellectual engagement, with you evaluating and deciding the final result. Look, Bay. The minion of law is also a racist, but his racism is basic and rude. He thinks he has solved the great race enigma by describing a rude mechanism of scientific competition. It is with that kind of mindset you are asked to pursue a political vision quest during your third night of unrestful sleep. The four quests outline the political system present in Elysium, stretching across history and space. The defeated communists, the relics of Rebochalian nationalism, or traditionalism, or rather fascism if we are being honest, the successful merciless ultra-liberal capitalists, and the regular moralist centrists that control Rebochal through an international coalition led by the moral intern. One important thing to point here, however, is how the political vision quests are systematized not only against the political background of Martinez, but through the lenses of our Amnesia Cop set of skills. Each of the four main attributes lends one of its associated skills to speak in favor of one of the four sides available to the player. Rhetoric for the communists, endurance for the fascists, savoir-faire for the ultra-liberals, and empathy for the moralists. If that makes you think politics are only important to Amnesia Cop through his own personal struggles, well, it's true. Each one of the quests confront the player character with his own past in different ways, leading to either abrupt alternative endings or realizations about what caused the drinking rampage of earlier years. In order for that to work, the game needs to approach each political side as, story-wise, inconsequential, given the other factors at play. Communists are stuck into studying bizarre theories and building 0.0001% of communism, one treatise at a time. What do you mean, is that it? You've done the reading, we talked about it, what more do you expect from a reading group? The fascist quest urges you to go back in time, but the best you can do is make a constipated expression after facing your involuntary celibacy. 
Now, open your eyes and witness the small wonder. Moralists want you to write a report and wait patiently for your bureaucratic appointment. You will be invited to address the committee at their next quarterly public hearing. We believe the next hearing is scheduled for July. Well, at least in the ultra-liberal quest you get rich. Being rich is great, but just don't kill anyone, I told you that. Ultimately, the social systems of Ravashaw provide a nihilistic take on the human condition. Every political side can see one part of the problem better, but once they try to move on, it is impossible to make progress, because there is nothing they can actually offer beyond generics or pipe dreams. We need to move a little bit away from social issues and concentrate on belief systems. What is the paranormal, or even the supernatural, or in other words still, the miraculous? Along with politics, one theme that appears prominently in Disco Elysium is paranormal phenomena. They are mostly on the optional content side of things, as the connections to the murder case are more flimsy than the political under themes. After all, the lynching was the result of an attempt by the Wild Pines company to quell a labor strike by using paramilitary detail. It cannot get more political than that. But from the first day there are several indications one should look elsewhere for the meaning of Disco Elysium and learn more about how the world works. Actually, in a very explicit manner. It will be different from player to player, but there are several opportunities to talk to people holding beliefs outside the mainstream, or at least outside of what King Katsuragi considers mainstream, as he is the character providing a more authoritative view on how the world is supposed to be and what is normal or not in this reality. There is Plaisance and her fear of a business curse that doomed the entire commercial center of Martinez, for which she protects against by relying on superstitious trinkets. There is Lina, the wife of a cryptozoologist dedicated to looking for animals that do not exist according to most biologists, the cryptids. You know, to hell with it. Let's have more cryptids. Going on, you can find other instances of paranormal activity around Martinez. No, no, not this one. There is a crab man living in a church. Weird presages about missing husbands or ominous feelings coming from the wind. I am La Rebachelière. I am the city. More often than not, engaging with these causes some reprimands from Kim, despite his own curiosity to see where things are going. Disco Elysium is not afraid to dabble in these supernatural speculations, but I wonder how many players actually decide to believe or to show they believe in weird things in the first playthrough. It's a bit of a digression, but I can say my first time was a bit too straight. I kept assuming the game world was basically the same as ours, only with a different history, and I also felt very bad for my character having drunk himself into oblivion. Not surprisingly, I became a sorry cop, eager to make amends and to not piss off poor Kim too much. I also avoided as much as possible saves coming, with the exception of moments I was curious about the alternative outcome, but always keeping the original order of failures and successes intact. The exception was the infamous shivers check, which I failed even after helping the kids create a dance club. But I did not know this helping the cryptozoologists would reopen the check, because, well, why should the both of them be connected? I assumed helping the kids in the church just narrowed down locations well enough that I would be able to find Ruby. But actually, it was about anthroponetics, the study of the pale, all the way down to breast eggs. The pale is not, technically speaking, part of reality. Quick recap, 
By this point in the story, you already realize the murder was not committed by the ones who confessed it immediately, the Hardy Boys. They are muscled to the Union and staged the lynching after one of the mercenaries hired to deal with their strike was shot through the window of a hotel as he was having sex with Classier. Whether you are suspicious of her or not, her mysterious and misleading attitude was enough to put you on the right track, and you start looking for Ruby, the eighth hardy boy, who apparently planned the whole thing to save Classier from being involved with the police. Maybe Ruby is the real killer, so you should look for her along the coast. That is the moment when the game opens up considerably, and new characters on the other side of the bridge are introduced. Some small mysteries from before are elaborated. You get to talk to the cryptozoologist. You find youngsters trying to set up a drug lab in a church nearby that eventually becomes a dance club. And the crab man turns out to be just an acrobatic devout. Everything seems to converge to the church and helping the kids while also helping Sonia, a failed game developer, to find some sort of anomaly. It seemed like a good deviation from the murder. But then you find the anomaly. In the silence, a low hum starts creeping up your spine. It's a song inside you, not in the speakers, not in the room. A great bass sigh in the basement of your mind. Slowly it builds until the air around you starts to vibrate. It will devour everything. The first time I played, I had no idea such a thing would happen. And I also had no real information on what the pale was. So it was my very first connection to a provable paranormal event in the game. There were witnesses, so it was not drugs or drinking. It was somewhat expected, but decisively weird. And for some reason, it reopened the shivers test I took and failed a few hours earlier, but I did not appreciate immediately what that discovery meant to understand Disco Elysium and why it had to happen in a church, in front of the broken stained glass of the Lord's Day. A religious system is a set of beliefs that becomes the origin of interpretations and explanations for all sorts of phenomena, including social and personal situations. The dominant religion in the world of Disco Elysium is Dolorianism, a personality cult over Dolores Day based on all her incredible and legendary achievements as a counselor to a queen and her reign as an innocence. There is a lot to discuss about how in Elysium there is a tacit acknowledgement that some individuals are so remarkable and represent the zeitgeist so well that society has no choice but to abide to their rule as an inevitability. But for our purposes, it suffices to point out Dolores Day's biggest accomplishment. To promote interisolary travel, that is, travel through the pale. It is no coincidence the major religious figure in this world is connected to the idea of conquering the pale, albeit in a limited manner. It is also no coincidence that after you finally find Ruby, she is able to stagger you and Kim by using a painful white noise machine. Suddenly, your entire body is paralyzed. Aggressive white noise fills your skull. A strange pain like you've never felt before. Through the static, you hear a woman's voice. The imagetic connection to the payo is even there. She is afraid of you, apparently due to a hoax that Harry is a hired gun for La Puta Madre, dangerous drug dealers she pissed off. But her answers seem to check out. Ruby was not responsible for the lynching plot, it was all classy. If she had any ulterior motive to create more animosity between Wild Pines and the Union, given her past as a corporate spy, you will not know. Classier is a character we spend some time with, but she's a blank slate in the end. Our skills cannot agree on her, and even after you learn they have been mostly deceived by her charm, correcting too much may be unwise. 
Ruby also fell under her influence and if you manage to escape from her, she will have no choice but to kill herself, afraid of what you and La Puta Madre would do to her. It is preferable to just let her slip and trigger the end game. Day of miracles. I'll take it. When you get away from the grasp of Ruby, the political struggle of the game comes to a climax. The mercenaries confront the Hardy Boys and want revenge for the death of their friend. You can intervene in a number of ways, but unless you are very lucky with your dice rolls and have your character in a very good position to succeed, odds are it will not be pretty. You will eventually get shot and miss part of the action. You wake up in not that good of a shape, but that is not new. It is likely several people are dead, including some you ended up respecting and liking over the course of the playthrough. The case is not solved, but the political cauldron of Martinez is going to explode one day. The Union closed the harbor, Cindy created her masterpiece, and the world is not better. All that you can do now is sail away to try to find the source of the shot that started the whole thing. And then you find the bunker. Some people consider the ending of Disco Elysium to be anticlimactic. The murderer is a character we only know exists when we already know he is the killer. As a detective story in the modes of Agatha Christie, it is indeed anticlimactic. But what many fail to realize is that Disco Elysium is only superficially a detective story. It is also a social historic novel documenting the depressive days of Ravachol under the coalition government, through focusing on the labor union and its appendages. It is an existential psychological thriller, with a protagonist divided upon himself in two dozen pieces, and struggling to make sense of his forgotten life. It is also the story of a failed revolution, and a failed marriage. And above all else, it is a story about the pale. It is in the bunker that you have your final moment of sleep and reconnect with your wife. I mean, Dolores Day. Through the dream, I mean, a nightmare. You live it all over again. The night when she left you forever because you were a mess. It is hard to argue with that, but from your perspective, Dolores Day is very cruel. Of course not. I terminated yours. Don't you remember? You poor fuck. Poverty-stricken fuck. And no matter your recent accomplishments or lack thereof, that moment is ultimately the source of your amnesia as it pushes you into a drinking rampage. Remembering it again, and remembering it in your dreams potentially forever, is your personal curse. This event is very powerful and it happens regardless of whatever else you did during the game. But the way you interact with it changes considerably. It is the second climax of the game, a more meaningful one as it provides existential closure, not to end the crisis, but to start actual coping. The murder mystery itself is about to be solved right after the nightmare. You find a very old man, a deserter from the revolution that stayed hidden around Martinez for decades, almost like a ghost metaphor of the impact communism and the military interventions against it had in Rebachol. Depending on information you collected or not beforehand, you can pin him down not only beyond the shadow of a doubt, but also extract a confession and a motive. Turns out his communism is only flavor for another kind of existential dread, with the deserter actually motivated to kill the mercenary out of jealousy for Classy. The parallels between Harry and the deserter are obvious, with the nightmare still lingering. The mystery is over, the game is ready to be over, and your task log is probably cleaned up. And then you see the cryptid.
the Insulinian Phasmid, the creature Lina and her husband were looking for unsuccessfully. It was there, all along, making company to the deserter without him knowing, and probably keeping his mind alive after so much time has passed. The true meaning of Disco Elysium, not only for the narrative but also for the gameplay, is found here. Exploring Martinez as much as possible is not just a completionist measure, it is gathering pieces of the real puzzle. Solving the murder only allows you to fill one of the gaps. Your skills and thoughts, figments of a personality that could only live in oblivion, are ways to interact with the several parts of a question that was missing a subject until now. The Phasmid puts everything in a new perspective and requires interpretation in a way that Tribunal or the Nightmare did not. The preconceptions of physics and metaphysics are now under heavy pressure. Like a couple of fellows of Krasmazov once said, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Only it is not capitalism, but a very tall and weird insect. Maybe as a delusion, maybe as a true connection through the ether, Amnesia Cop can speak to the creature and unveil the mystery of its existence. Phasmids, and presumably other cryptids, are afraid of humans. What could devolve into a simple and uninteresting discourse about how humans destroy the environment and a metaphor for climate change is actually a more philosophical understanding of the human condition. It is a nervous shadow cast into the world by you, eating away at reality. A great, unnatural territory. Is that one coincides with the arrival of the human mind. Disco Elysium already interpreted humans as the combination of ancestral instincts tempered through two dozen skills often in conflict, as political animals in need of interactions to better understand themselves, as sexual beings that cannot stand loneliness until they become destructive to others and themselves. But the Phasmid knows more tells Harry the humans are the origin of the Pale. It is very hard to explain what the Pale is and the game wants to keep it that way. The closest to a pseudo-scientific explanation is a sea of nothingness that permeates the isolated continents that constitute the world of Disco Elysium, an amorphous mass where everything dissipates, including noise, thoughts, numbers. As mentioned before, Dolores Day earned a good amount of her reputation as a divine being by instigating travels through the Pale, which are still extremely dangerous to the human mind. And it is expanding, like our own real universe, but uncomfortably close and risking erasing existence altogether. And by now, you know, there is a small bit of Pale right there in Martinez thousands of kilometers from the no pale frontier. The real anti-climax comes right after, as you are faced with your colleagues from the precinct and have the opportunity to recap everything you have done. This will play out differently depending on your choices and achievements, but getting the photograph of the phasmid always makes for an interesting impression. Nevertheless, the realization humans may be causing their own demise and of the entire universe, and how that is intimately connected with your own struggles, that is less compelling to your no-nonsense partner. How much you believe in the words of the cryptid, or rather how much you believe it is indeed the cryptid and not your shattered mind speculating about the world, is a matter of preference. I choose to believe but not only because it makes for a more powerful message. Disco Elysium is a rich world with so many possible approaches that limiting the interpretation is not that appealing. However, I encourage you to embrace anthroponetics anyway. It is tempting to spend too much time in mundane pursuits, like politics or sex or getting rich, all ultimately purposeless. Staring into the nothingness as creatures of the pale that we are, 
unveils the final mystery the game does not solve because it is a part of it, through narrative and gameplay. Can we be more than failures? Is it possible to find a system to prevent an abrupt ending for humanity? Or are we the abrupt ending itself? Maybe the answer is one dice row away.